Welcome to First Baptist Church. You're listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead. Please check us out on the internet at fbcboron.org. Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 30. And the word of the Sovereign Lord reads this way. They went from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for they For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silence, for on the way they had argued with one another, about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve and said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Martin Luther, the reformer, once wrote, Anyone who is to find Christ must first find the church. How could anyone know where Christ is and what faith is in him unless he knew where his believers are? I believe in Jesus, but I don't feel the need to go to church. Have you heard that before? Have you maybe even said that before? How about this one? I love Jesus, but I I hate the church. Jesus is awesome, but his people are awful. I follow Christ, but I don't don't want to be part of an organized religion because organized religion is what's wrong with this world. I don't need some pastor in my life. I don't need to meet regularly with other believers. I don't need someone preaching at me. I don't need theology. I don't need doctrine. In fact, doctrine is what divides the world. The problem with Christianity is people argue over doctrine all the time. In fact, the church is full of hypocrites who spend all their time talking about doctrine and theology and telling me how I should live my life. But they're no better than me. So I don't need them. I don't need the church. This is the attitude of a great many people in our country. This is the attitude of a great many people in our own community. This is the attitude of many of our family members and even people that are our friends. This is the attitude of many people who claim to be believers. People who said that they have been born again. People who claim that they have moved from life to death and come to faith in Christ. People who claim that they've been radically transformed by the word of God and by the love of God. That somehow, in some way, that all a person needs in their Christian life is to make a profession of faith in Christ at some point, and then maybe read the Bible on their own and pray, and that somehow they they have all that they need to become a maturing, faithful follower of Christ. That's what many people believe. But hear me. As popular as that belief is, it's completely false. It's completely wrong. In fact, it is a lie from the pit of hell. And if you believe that, if you believe that lie, that somehow you can become the man or woman of God that he's calling you to be without being invested in a body of believers, you need to repent of that belief today because it's false. If you believe that somehow you can learn to follow Christ and become the disciple that he's calling you to be without being plugged into a church family that has a high view of scripture and a high view of Christ, you need to repent of that today because it's a lie. Because you need the church. I need the church. Hear me on this. You need the church. You need doctrine. You need theology. You need faithful preaching in your life. You need constant and faithful Bible teaching. You need to be surrounded by other people in your life going in the same direction that you are going. Loving you. Encouraging you. Teaching you. You need to be shepherded. 
You need the care and the guidance of faithful men and women of God. You need, I need, the church. If for no other reason, you need the church to, to be discipled and to be trained to actually follow Christ. right? Because that is the calling on your life. If you're a Christian, you're not simply called to believe some things about Jesus and then live the rest of your life satisfied in the knowledge that you have. You are called to be his disciple, to actively follow him, to go where he goes, to go where he leads. And that is not something that you're going to learn to do on your own. Now you might say, well, you're wrong. <laughs> I can do that. Pastor, I got my own Bible. I can read it for myself. I can learn everything I need to know by myself. Right? It's just me and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and my Bible, and I can learn to, to, to be Christ's disciple without, go, without the church and without anybody else's help. Well, the text that we're going to look at today is, is proof positive that is simply not true. When we look at this text today, you will discover that this is not true. You see, the passage we're going to look at today not only has it, does it have something to teach us about what it means to follow Christ, it actually demonstrates the fact that, that, we are, that, 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 that we're going, there are going to be things that are in the Bible. There are going to be things in the Bible that we're going to struggle to understand on our own unless there is someone to disciple us and to teach us and help us. Because today's text is one of those ones you are not going to fully understand by reading it on your own. In fact, there will probably be some things that you will learn today that you will, you will say, I had no idea. That's what that meant. You're not going to fully understand what Jesus is communicating unless you have the ability on your own to place this text in its full context. And when I say full context, I mean historical context, cultural context, the literary context, and its immediate context in the overall story that Mark is telling here. You're not going to be able to fully understand what Christ is saying if all you do is to simply read this in an English translation without help. Because notice, I want you to notice okay, what, what Jesus ends up saying here. If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Which seems kind of straightforward. But then immediately after that it says, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but he who sent me. And even though those two statements sound very different, those two statements actually are about the same exact subject. They might appear different, but they are the same exact subject. These statements are addressing the same foundational issue. Jesus is making the same points. He's not making two different statements. He's making one critical overarching point about what it means to follow him. When he talks about the first being the last and then receiving a child, he's talking about discipleship. But the thing is, when you pick up your Bible and you simply read these two statements in English, it's really easy to miss that fact because you're going to read those statements from the perspective of the culture that you live in today. That Jesus here is making an emphatic point is something that's easy for us to miss. And just like last week's message, what Jesus is saying here is actually critical for us to understand in order to truly learn what it means to follow him, to be his disciple. Hear me on this. What Jesus is saying here is vital for us to understand what it means to be a follower of Christ. So let me just set the context up for you here. As you know, that we're in chapter 9 of the Gospel of Mark, and we talked about that the first part of this Gospel was about answering the question of who is Jesus. If you remember, Mark opened up with the words that Jesus, that Jesus is the Son of God. He makes that declaration from the very beginning, and then he sets out to prove that statement by recording for us the things that Jesus says and also the mind-blowing miracles that Jesus performs. Mark proves that Jesus is the Son of God, that he's God in the flesh, and he is sovereign over the physical world, and he's sovereign over the spiritual world. And all of that then culminates when Peter, with supernatural, God-given insight, says that you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That you are the Christ. right? Which is what the first part of the gospel is all about. Establishing who Jesus is. 
And then the next section, the section that we're in right now, is about answering uh, the question of why he came. Now that we know who he is, why did he come? And more, and more than that, what does that mean for those who are called to follow him? Now, now, now there's a statement that, that defines this entire section here. That, that, that actually is from the words of Jesus himself. Mark chapter 8, verse 21. Is it, if you want to know what this section really is about, is this. Jesus says, do you not yet understand? This right here is the phrase that's going to describe this entire section here. Do you not yet understand? Because in this section, we're going to see the apostles, they're going to struggle over and over again to understand what Jesus is saying about why he came and what it means to then follow him as a result. Three times, Jesus is going to tell them clearly he's going to suffer, that he is going to die, and that he then will be raised again three days later. Three times, he clearly spells it out for them. And they're not going to understand. And three times he's going to explain to them that following him isn't about what they think it means to follow him. And in this section, they're going to demonstrate that they are not understanding him. And they're going to demonstrate that they're still struggling with spiritual blindness. In fact, as we talked about before, this section of Mark's gospel begins and ends with Jesus healing someone who was blind. This is not an accident. These miracles though real, are also a metaphor about what these disciples are going through. They are struggling with spiritual blindness. They they need Jesus to open their eyes, and he does. But the process will take time. Remember, the section begins where Jesus restores a man's sight by touching him, but he doesn't restore his sight all the way at first. Jesus opens his eyes, and he can see. He just can't see very clearly at first. And then Jesus touches him again, and then he fully restores his sight. This event at the beginning of the section is a visual metaphor about for what these apostles are going through. They, they are beginning to see, but they still don't see clearly yet. They're beginning to understand, but they don't understand fully yet. That's why Peter triumphantly declares Jesus to be Christ. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Peter, because God has revealed this to you. Right? Good job, Peter. But then in the same conversation, Jesus mentions that he's going to suffer and die and be resurrected. And Jesus is like, no, that's not going to happen to you. What are you talking about, Jesus? Clearly demonstrating that even though he understands who, that Jesus is the Messiah, he didn't understand what it meant for him to be the Messiah. He didn't understand Christ's mission and his part in Christ's mission. That's why Jesus tells them they must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow him. Because they think that Jesus is going to be the king of Israel. And that they're going to be the VIPs in the new kingdom. They didn't truly understand what what it meant to be a follower of Christ. Their eyes were open, but they're not seeing clearly yet. And this confusion continues on in this particular text. So turn with me to Mark chapter 9. Beginning in verse 30 it says, And when they went from there and passed through Galilee... And he did not want anyone to know. Now, what you need to realize is Jesus is not going back to Galilee for ministry. His ministry in Galilee is done. His ministry in the surrounding areas at this point is done. He is going back to Galilee in preparation for his, his journey to Jerusalem. Right? You see, we're at a place where the story is now going to be, begin to accelerate towards the cross. Remember, Mark is a gospel that is fast-paced and action-packed, and it rushes towards Calvary. And we're at a point right now where things are going to begin moving very, very fast. Jesus is on his way very soon to Jerusalem to fulfill the mission of why he came. That's why Jesus, in this section, is going to repeatedly try to tell them why he's here. He's going to tell them over and over again that he's going to die and be resurrected, which is exactly what he says here, right? It says, they went from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered in the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask him. So here we are once again. Jesus is clearly stating what's going to happen. 
Jesus says, the Son of Man, this is the messianic title that he uses for himself over again. He says, the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men. And the Greek construction of this phrase, especially the word delivered, hints at the fact that it's not going to be a man that's going to deliver Jesus over to death. Actually, the Greek construction here gives us the sense that it is God himself that's going to deliver him over into the hands of men. You see, what Jesus is communicating as clearly as possible is what was about to happen is the sovereign will and the plan of God the Father. Jesus will be delivered into the hands of men. Not may be delivered. He will be delivered. Is what God has willed to happen. Right? He's, he may not be killed. He will be killed. They're going to kill him for sure. It's a foregone conclusion. It's going to happen. There's no wiggle room here in his words. He will die. But just as sure as he's going to be handed over to his enemies, and just as sure as they're going to kill him, three days later, he will rise. Not maybe, not possibly, not theoretically, but absolutely. You see, Jesus right here is graphically and clearly telling them, right, once again, why he has come. He has come to suffer and die and to be resurrected. The language here that he uses could not be any more clear. I mean, there are times in the Bible where, where, where we can say, you know, Jesus wasn't really like completely out in the open about that, right? He's very clear here. But notice it says in, in verse 32 that they did not understand what he was saying and they were afraid to ask him. Don't let that pass you by. We see the clear words of Jesus and it says, they didn't understand. Think about that. As clear as what Jesus said as clear as his words are they don't understand they are still battling spiritual blindness do you yet not yet understand they don't understand the plain truth of christ's words is eluding them they can't see what's right before their very eyes but this time it says they don't even talk to him about it because they're afraid well why well probably because what happened the last time when peter you know confronted Jesus about what he said. <laughs> Peter spoke up and Jesus was like, get behind me, Satan. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be quick to like jump in on that conversation either. Jesus said, you're not thinking about the things of God. You're thinking about the things of man. And so they probably are intimidated at this point to even address the subject. But the fact is they didn't understand the mission of Christ. And guess what? That means they didn't understand their part in the mission either. Because notice what happens next. It says, and they came to Capernaum, which is Jesus' base of operation, if you remember. And when he was in the house, which is probably Peter or Andrew's house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? They kept silent. <clears throat> For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Now what we need to do is we need to take a moment and actually visualize what's happening here. <clears throat> because a little more than a week before, Peter makes this confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, but then he rebukes Jesus when Jesus tells him plainly why he came, and Jesus rebukes him and the other disciples and said, your mind is set on the wrong things. You're not set on the things of God. Right? And then not only is Jesus going to suffer and die and, and, and be raised again, but, but the, how, what they believe about following Christ, right, is, is all wrong because they're actually going to have to follow him even maybe even to their own death and their own suffering as well. And so Jesus completely turns upside down their notion of the future and with their heads still spinning, Jesus, you know, he says to them, he promises them that some of you here are going to see the kingdom of God come with power. And six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, who were probably still very emotionally shook up by this, up to the mountain to pray, and while they're up there, he fulfills his promise as Jesus, as they behold Jesus' uh, divine glory up on the mountain, as he's transfigured. Remember, Jesus glowed in the middle of the night to the point where it says his face shone like the sun. And not only that, then Moses and Elijah show up, and if that's not enough, then God, the cloud of God's Shekinah glory surrounds them, and then they hear the audible voice of God the Father who says, this is my son, listen to him. 
Pay attention to what he's saying. And then when they come down the mountain, Jesus says, don't say anything about this until I'm resurrected, which confuses these guys even more. And they get to the bottom of the mountain, and Jesus has to intercede for these for these other nine apostles who couldn't cast out a demon, something that they had done many times before. They had failed. And Jesus reminds them they failed is because they had lost sight of their dependence upon him. And then leaving from there, Jesus again begins to talk about his impending suffering and death and resurrection. And you would think then, after all of these events, that these men at this point would have more than enough to think about and meditate on and pray about. Their minds would have been filled with with all that they had seen and all that had happened and all that they had heard in such a short amount of time. You would think that they would be wondering about, you know, what what does that mean that Jesus said? What does this mean that Jesus said? Especially with respect to now he said twice that he's going to die and be resurrected. Twice he's explaining to them what's going to happen in the future, and they still don't get it. Not only do they not get why Jesus came, they don't get what it means to truly follow Christ. Because as they're walking along, right, what are they doing? They're arguing. And what are they arguing about? Who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to be the greatest disciple? Who's going to be the greatest disciple in the new kingdom once Jesus is the king? Who is going to be the number one VIP? That's what they're arguing about. (coughs) Because these men, despite what Jesus is saying, still believe that somehow Jesus is going to be the king of Israel and then they're going to be his chief advisors. They believe that Jesus will ascend to the throne of David and restore Israel back to world superpower status. And they will then live a life of power and prestige because they're the closest people to Jesus. They're going to be the closest people to the king. That is what they believe. And what you need to understand is that this dream, this is the dream that they've been holding on to all their life. This dream is vitally important to them. This idea of becoming VIPs is not simply a little wish for them. This is not just a passing fancy for them. All of their hopes are bent on this. This is Their greatest desire is to be the visible VIPs in the coming kingdom. They want to be part of the king's entourage. They want to be people of high stature in the new Israel. And the reason is, is because culturally, that was normal. In fact, every part of life in the first century was like that. There was this social hierarchy of importance that existed. Whether it was the government or the synagogue or the community or in the home, there there was a social hierarchy where people were ranked from the very most important to the very least important. People were, in every setting, judged and esteemed from the most important person to the least important person. Now, our Western minds, this might sound a little bit over the top to us. Why are they so worried about this? Because at least in theory, we all believe on some level that people are created equal. And that we believe, at least in theory, that everyone has similar worth, that everyone is important. The rich and poor alike are basically equally valuable, at least as human beings. Not to say that we don't discriminate and that we don't put people up on pedestals or that we don't get starstruck, and we don't value at times more people over over others. The reality is, for the most part, we tend to look at people as equally valuable. The fact is, when you go to the football game on Friday night, there are no seats of honor for the most important people. Everybody sits where everybody sits. In fact, in our community, teachers are not seen as more important than truck drivers in the pit. And electricians are not more important than maintenance workers at the school. Nor are pastors more important than deacons. And the fact is we all basically dress the same. Right? We all eat at the same tables. Right? We all seem to esteem one another the same. And people don't walk around bowing down to each other and kissing each other's hands. Right? So this is kind of different for us, but it was not like that in the first century. In fact, Temper Longman in his commentary writes, the dispute among the disciples is not surprising in light of ancient Near Eastern culture. 
in which honor and status and position were the utmost of importance. Right? In both Greco-Roman and Jewish contexts, place of honor at all public events, such as banquets, were carefully assigned according to one's status. The rabbis even discussed the seating order in paradise and who would be positioned closer to the throne of God. This idea of status was important. This was their life. right? This was their theology. This was something that was supposed to be in this life and in the life in the future. So understand, these men are not simply just being childish and immature as they're talking about this. They, they were living out the worldview that they were brought up with. For them, this was a serious subject. They knew there was going to be a new kingdom, which for them meant that there was going to be a new social order and everything was going to be turned upside down. And they thought that one of them was going to be the greatest person in the world next to Jesus Christ. One of them was going to be the most respected human being in Israel next to Christ. And culturally, <clears throat> that was of utmost importance to them. And this truth blinded them to what Jesus was trying to teach them about why he came and what it meant to follow him. Because in their understanding of the new kingdom, the idea of a dead Messiah, that didn't make any sense to them. And the idea of them suffering didn't make any sense either. What Jesus was talking about didn't fit into their established worldview. What made sense to them was Jesus was going to be king and all of them would be super important. And one of them would be the most important next to Jesus. One of them was going to be the greatest. And that's what they were arguing about. But then Jesus, <clears throat> like he does all the time, he turns their worldview upside down. Notice what he says in verse 35. And he sat down and he called the twelve. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And I'm going to have to admit, brothers and sisters, I have read this, those words hundreds of times, and I have missed the earth-shattering magnitude of what this statement is getting at. I've read this so many times that I have thought to myself, I agree with that. That makes sense to me. I mean, that sounds right. Those who are greatest are those who put other people first, right? Those who are the greatest are people who, who are compassionate and serve other people, Right? And the reason why I agree with this and the reason why I believe that is because I grew up in Western, a Western culture built on Western values. And, and I grew up hearing about things like servant leadership. I think we've all heard that phrase before, servant leadership. It's a big buzzword in, in the business world. Right? If you want to be an effective leader, then you need to be what? A servant leader. Right? If you want to be a successful CEO, you need to be someone who serves your people. That's why they, they, they call them public servants. Right? That's what we're told. In fact, Zig Ziglar, which is one of the most influential motivational speakers in the 20th century, he puts it this way. He says, you can have everything you want in life as long as you're willing to help enough other people get what they want. If you'll just serve enough other people and help them get where they want to go, then you can have the life that you want. You will be successful. You will be a great leader. And that right there is the lens through which most of us see this particular text. We look at Jesus' words and we think that that makes sense, not realizing that we have missed the point by a thousand miles. What Jesus is saying here isn't a call to fulfill your dreams by helping other people. It isn't a call to aspire to social greatness by being compassionate and serving other people. The call here, the call here is to sell out for the kingdom of God. That's the call. And to sell out for the kingdom of God is to become, and to become great in the kingdom of God is to, is to become radically different than the rest of the world. You see, what Jesus is saying here is absolutely earth shattering because they think greatness is to be first, first in line, first to be seated, first to be served, first in honor. Their whole worldview, right? Every part of their life, all of their aspirations is about being First, or being as close to first as possible. That's their hopes and dreams. But Jesus says, true greatness is not to be first, but rather putting all others first. That's what he's saying. True greatness is, is to be last. 
and not first. That you put everyone else first and you make yourself last in order of priority. This right here is a radical shift in thinking for these men. This is the complete opposite of how they grew up. This is the complete opposite of how they were taught when they were young. This is the complete opposite of everything that the culture represents for them. Don't seek to be first. Instead, put everyone else first, is what Jesus is saying. And and to emphasize this point, he said, be a servant of all. Because true greatness is not being served by all others. True greatness is serving all others. And again, the worldview these men live by was the idea that, that you were great if you had people who served you and waited on you hand and foot. That was, a, that was the status symbol of your greatness. It was a mark of your importance. And what Jesus is saying very clearly is the opposite of that is true. In fact, the word that Jesus uses here for servant, right? this word often is translated as, as waiter, someone who waits on tables. That's the word that he's using here. A real servant. And, and the Greek word uh, that he uses here actually has two root words. One of the word is dust, and one of the word is thoroughly. And you put these two words together, it creates a word picture of this idea of someone that's moving so fast and someone that's so busy serving that they're stirring up a trail of dust as they go about doing what they're doing. That's what the word literally means. It's this idea of someone on a mission, actively, energetically serving. In fact, that's actually the same word that we use for deacon, by the way. What Jesus is saying here is greatness in the kingdom of heaven is the exact opposite of what greatness is in the rest of the world. Greatness in the kingdom of heaven is the exact opposite of of what greatness is in the rest of the world. Those who are great in God's kingdom are people who put everyone else first and are busy working, serving everyone else. Make no mistake, that's what he's saying here. Those who are the greatest in the kingdom of God are people who put everyone else first and are busy serving everyone else. Now, we might not completely identify with these disciples' sense of cultural importance, We might not certainly aspire to be the most important person in our families or our communities or even our place of employment. But these words still should be earth-shattering to our worldview. These words should shatter our own understanding of what it means to follow Christ. Because let me ask you a question. When you prioritize your life, do you put all other people around you first. All other people first. Above yourself. And I'm not just talking about your friends and your family. That that, that doesn't count. I'm talking about everyone else. The people at work. The people at school. Your co-workers. Your boss. Your fellow students. Your underclassmen. Your teachers. Even the teachers that annoy the daylights out of you. Do you view them as more important than yourself? Do you treat them as if they're more important than you are? Do you humble yourself and elevate them and put their needs above your own? Do you, does how you talk to these people and treat these other people say, you're important to me? Does it say that you're valuable to me? What about your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you make a point to find a way to serve them too? To help them? To lift their burdens? To demonstrate to them that they are of high value to you? Now before you object to this, okay, you say that's hard. That's exactly what Jesus did especially the night he was arrested. If you remember in John chapter 13, and I'm not going to go through all that detail, read it, please. John chapter 13, 
He tells us that during dinner, Jesus did what? He gets up from dinner, gets up from the table, he takes off his outer coat and puts a towel around himself and gets a pitcher of water and a bowl out. And what does he do? He washes his disciples' feet. And what we know from that culture, this, this was a task that was reserved for the very least important person in society. Right? If you're washing someone's feet as a grown-up, you're the least important person around you. Other servants are like, no, I'm more important than you. I'm going to go shovel the, the, the donkey stuff. You wash the feet. That's why Peter protested. That's why Peter said, you're not going to wash my feet. Because Jesus was the most important person that he knew. Right? But here Jesus is humbling himself to serve his disciples by washing their feet. He takes the posture of the least important person in their culture and he serves them. Jesus did exactly what he said for them to do. And remember Jesus said in, in, in John, he says, <clears throat> You call me teacher and Lord, and you were right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do just as I've done for you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you do these things, blessed are. I mean, if if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So do you? Do you put everyone else before you? And are you willing to do whatever it takes to serve those around you, even if it means what you're doing is beneath you, like, like Jesus? Now you might say, wait a minute, Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Right? These people were important to him. These people respected him. These people loved him. It's easy to serve those who, who love you, right? Remember, Jesus washed his disciples' feet before Judas left. That means Jesus lovingly washed his enemies' feet. You see, what Jesus is saying here is life in the kingdom is to be radically different from the rest of the world, radically different from the culture, radically different from even our own experiences and our own expectations. Life in the kingdom and following Christ is about a radical paradigm shift where the, where, where the focus of your life is no longer you. The focus is Christ followed by everyone else and then you. And when I say everyone else, I'm, I mean everyone else. In fact, that's what we're going to see next in what Jesus says. It says, And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. This verse by itself right here is proof for the fact that you need to be part of a church. Because this is the part of the text. If you cannot, con cannot connect the dot dots con contextually, you're not going to understand <clears throat> what Jesus is, is saying here. You see, the problem for, for us is that when we look at this text, we read it and go, oh, that warms our heart. Jesus, right, he's being sweet. He takes this little child and he holds it in his arm. What a great picture of the love of Christ, right? He has this innocent child in his arms and says, if you receive one of these, then you receive me. And this spawns all kinds of wild speculation about what that means and the value of the innocence of children and on and on and on and on. But that's not even close to what the point is. Not even remotely. You see, the problem that we have is that we come to this text with Western eyes and from a Western cultural perspective, and one of the things that's unique about our Western culture is we live in a culture that has a high value of children. That's just what we know. That's the world we have grown up with. That's why we have laws that protect children from abuse and child labor and, and sexual exploitation. That's why there's, there's laws that... That regulate toys. That's why we have we have nurseries and schools and parks and expensive ball fields. That's why we spend so much money on children. If you're a parent, say amen. amen. Right? 
We spend a lot of money on our kids. And, and, and that's also the reason why that in our culture there's a such thing as helicopter parents. Because culturally, children are important to us. They're valuable to us. We tend to value children over grown-ups. Right? But you need to understand that this is a Western Christian way of seeing the world. This is a paradigm that developed after Christ ascended into heaven as a result of his work here on earth. And what you need to realize is this is not at all how they saw things in Jesus' time. That was not their point of view at this time. In fact, children in the first century had very little value. That's foreign to you. You don't understand. You can't. You can't relate to that. I, I get that. But in that culture, children had very little value. They were considered unimportant. They were amongst the very least of important in society. It was not uncommon for parents to be tired of their kids and just let them die. In fact, there was a point in history that, like, I think seven out of ten children were just. They died not because of just disease. It's just parents didn't want them anymore. Beasts of burden were seen as more important than children. And I know this sounds strange to us, but historically, this is, this is the reality here. Children were quite literally the least valuable people in society, less valuable than the least important foot-washing servant. They were not looked upon as little Bundles of joy and treasures. They were seen actually as leeches and as unimportant. And so Jesus taking this child in his arms was not a sweet picture of Jesus loving an innocent, precious child. This was an image of Jesus saying, even the least important person in the entire world has great value in the kingdom of God. That's what this means. That's what he's saying. The least important person in the world has great value in the kingdom of God. And that's what we miss when we think that we're simply going to read a text like this in English and and without any help. Jesus is saying that the least important person in the world has great value in the kingdom of God. He's saying that true greatness is valuing and loving the lowest of the low. In fact, Jesus said, if you receive these little ones, one of the least value in the kingdom, you receive Christ himself, and by extension, God himself. And the idea of receiving someone is this idea of hospitality. That's what it literally means. It's hospitality. If you welcome them, right, it's like welcoming them into your home and esteeming the least important as as highly honored guests. You see the contrast there? It's to place them in a position of honor and to serve them. That's what he's saying. That we are to value and honor and serve the least important, those who least deserve it. Which means following Jesus is about valuing and serving literally everyone else around us those that we like and and those not so much. Those who are good to us and maybe those who are not so good to us. Those who say thank you and, and those who take us for granted. Those who can return the favor and those who can never repay us in a million years. The disciples thought that their life in the kingdom was going to be about position and prestige But Jesus, again, flips their understanding upside down and says life in the kingdom is about sacrifice and humility and service to everyone. Which, by the way, is the example that Jesus himself lived all the way to the cross. Not only did Jesus wash his disciples' feet, Jesus condescended and left his throne in heaven above. He left his throne in heaven to be born in a manger. And he hid his divine glory in order to become a man like us and to walk in our shoes and to identify with us. Jesus, God, elevated us to 
a place of importance. Not because we're important, but because he decided to make us important. He suffered with us and for us, and he was not ashamed to be associated with the lowest of the low. If you remember, the Pharisees complained regularly about Jesus doing what? Having dinner with the sinners and the tax collectors, the worst of the worst. And he was willing to, to work himself to exhaustion in order to serve everyone that came in contact. Remember, his family thought he was crazy because he was working so hard at times he didn't even eat. He would oftentimes stay up late at night healing people and casting out demons. And he did this for the ungrateful and the unrepentant and also those who despised and mocked him at some point. Jesus, the Son of Man, did not come to be served but to serve. And there's nothing... He wasn't willing to do for others. In fact, he willingly allowed himself to be delivered into the hands of men and to be tortured and to be killed. And he did that to pay the penalty for those who absolutely deserve nothing but the justice of Almighty God. He paid a penalty you couldn't pay. And he took upon himself the sins of those he came to save. And he bore in his own body the awful and terrible wrath of God the Father, the wrath that you and I rightly deserve. And in return, he gave to us his righteousness so that we, the worst of the worst, the very least important in all the kingdom, that we could be reconciled back to God and not reconciled as strangers and not as enemies that he now tolerates, but as his family. We, the least important in all the kingdom, are now allowed to come to God and cry out, Abba, Father. Christ put everyone first, and he died to serve all, even the very least of us. You see, true greatness is Christ-likeness. <coughs> True greatness in the kingdom of heaven is to be more and more like Jesus. So what do we what do we do with this then? Because let's face it, this is a tall order to fill. I get it. Putting everyone else first and serving everyone else, even the least important around us, the least deserving, that's that's tough. But let's not misunderstand. That is the call here. That's what we're being called to. Following Christ and being his disciple is this. Humbling ourselves and putting everyone else first and getting busy serving and even valuing the least valuable. Brothers and sisters, that's what we're called to. If you call yourself Christian, if you call yourself by the name of Christ, that's what he's calling you to. There's no way around it. But Pastor Sherman, this is so hard. Like, I mean, like seriously, there are people who just upset me, and there are people who just seem to take and take and take and take and never give, and there are people who just don't deserve it. And, and not to mention, I've got other priorities. I've got this retirement plan where I'm going to spend the rest of my life on a beach collecting seashells, you know, and i got to make a priority for that. And this is just so much to ask. And people are just so icky and frustrating, and it's just so hard. I can't do this. Um. That's why Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him, what? Deny himself. Take up his cross, an instrument of torture and death, and follow me. Because it is going to be hard. Brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ, this is what you're called to, right here. To live radically different lives or you esteem everyone else ahead of you, and you get busy serving everyone else, even those who don't deserve it. And yes, it's going to be hard. And yes, at times it's going to be gut-wrenching. And at times it will be deeply painful. And at times it will be joyful and rewarding. And at times it's going to be heart-rending. But so is self-denial and cross-bearing. This will be hard at times. This is what you and I are called to. And this right here, by the way, is why you and I need the church. Because you can't do this by yourself. 
You need elders and pastors in your life who will look you in the eye and lovingly tell you the truth, even when it's a hard truth to tell. Like this one. You need fellow brothers and sisters in your life who will help you grow, and who will help you walk this out, and who will encourage you. Because this is what it means to follow Christ. You want to know what it means to follow Jesus? This is it. And, and again, as you can see, we're not built or equipped to do this on our own. We absolutely need the church. We, without question, need one another. So let us all settle that in our minds and begin to esteem one another, serve each other, and build each other up in love. That's what we're calling it. You've been listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead, a production of First Baptist Church in Boron, California. Our website address is fbcboron.org. And would you please consider partnering with us financially as we work to share the hope and the gospel of Jesus Christ with our community and our world.